some live law ka side to you know no i have bought like... all the things na so i have begin it all theek hai theek hai Sumit bhaiya please confirm one once ma'am joins What to confirm Whenever ma'am joins if you Ha ha sure Keep a look out on there in case I am waiting for the panelist link <coughs> I have sent to Tanik bhaiya Okay okay I'll just check WhatsApp Jivesh, can you send it to Caucus ID? Yes, I will. A panel. Yeah, please do. sent Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Hello, ma'am. We are very happy to have you with us here today. 
Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Good evening, Indra ji. I'm Veena Rally this side. Good evening to you. Good evening. Pleasure. Same here. It's my pleasure, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, ma'am, we will be beginning in uh, a minute or two uh, uh, as soon as a few more participants join in and uh, we'll just begin in a minute. Uh, Sanya? So, you have my recorded speech already, right? Yes. Yes, we do. Mm. I'll be with you and I'll be with you for the Q&A. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Okay. Hello and welcome to Compass 2021, brought to you by Caucus, the discussion forum and the internal quality assurance cell of Hindu College. I am Sanya and I will be your host for the day. A year into the pandemic and we have learned how to function within the four boundaries of our screens. Although it limited mobility and to some extent also functionality, the pandemic was not without its silver linings, especially for our students because it brought the student community closer to learning. Today, we are in conversation and honored to have with us Ms. Jai Singh, who is an eminent lawyer and a senior advocate of the Supreme Court and the first woman to become one, discussing the topic of freedom of religion and secularism. For the information of our audience, I would also like to add that the session is also being live streamed on YouTube on Live Loss Channel, who is our media partner for this session. Without further ado, I would like to invite the president of caucus, Shabdata Tewari, to deliver the introductory remarks. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Sanya. Uh, welcome, ma'am, and we are honored to have you here with us today. Uh, Compass is a unique lecture series that was born out of the opportunities of the initial lockdown last year, and we are extremely delighted to be continuing its legacy today. Our speaker today requires no introduction, but I will proceed with it, with it nonetheless. Uh, Ms. Indra Jaising is a senior advocate at the Supreme Court of India and a prominent human rights activist, who also served as the first woman additional solicitor general of India. Ms. Jaising has been on the forefront for fighting for social causes and women empowerment. Her years of experience and expertise in human rights, especially those pertaining to religion and feminism, will be extremely useful to many aspiring scholars and academicians who are present with us here today. The topic at hand is freedom of religion and secularism, which becomes even more pertinent when we look at the unique model of secularism that India follows, and uh, adding that it has been a subject of conversation for many, many years. Uh, we are extremely lucky to have such a prominent scholar like Ms. Jessing uh, with us and uh, who shall be undoing the intricacies of the subject. So without any further ado, I hand over to Sanya to continue with the proceedings of the session. Very, very welcome, ma'am. And we hope to have a very enlightening talk with you today. Thank you. Uh, we are indeed honored to have Ms. Jessing with us today. Amongst the audience, we also have Advocate Veena Rali and Advocate Jaspreet Singh Rai from Delhi High Court who are attending the session. For our next segment, Anima and Nishant will deliver a short timer pre primer presentation for the convenience of our audience. Nishant and Anima, over to you.
Nishant, you are on mute. Uh, am I audible now? Yes. Okay. Sorry for the inconvenience. Hello, everyone. Today, Anima and I, Nishan, are going to provide an outline of the topic, Freedom of Religion and Secularism. India has always been following the doctrine of Sarv Dharm Sambhav, which advocates that all religions are same, and that certainly was the mentality of our Constituent Assembly's members. They agreed upon the nature of the Indian state adhering to secular principles, but were quite resistant to add the term in the original constitution. Instead, they agreed to include a whole set of fundamental rights guaranteeing the freedom of religion from Article 25 to Article 28. Thus, the version of secularism embraced by India does not fancy the idea of erecting a strict wall of separation similar to Western countries, but proposes to maintain a principal distance between religion and state. However, in India, the state has the power to regulate secular activities associated with religious practices. But this raises the question of what is the line that separates secular activities from religious activities. The same question was taken up in the Shiruru Mutta case of 1954, where the Supreme Court described that the term religion will cover all the rituals and practices integral to it, and thereby develop the doctrine of essential religious practice test, which offers protection to only those religious practices which are essential and integral to a religion. Eventually, in the Sabrimala Temple case, the Supreme Court stuck down the provision restricting the entry of women into the temple in the light of the same doctrine. It was also applied to the Triple Talaq case as well. On November 9, 2019, a constitution bench of Supreme Court permitted the construction of a temple at the site where the Babri Masjid once stood in Ayodhya, thus ending centuries-long dispute between Hindus and Muslims and a fodder for Mandir Masjid politics. When the Ram Jan Bhumi dispute was at its height, tensions also arose around Gyanwapi Mosque in Varanasi and Shah Idga in Mathura. Under this backdrop, a legislative instrument to freeze the status of any place of worship as it existed on 15th August 1947 was enacted as the Places of Worship Act 1991. Of late, the Supreme Court has sought sentence response on a plea against the act. So there have been several instances where the judiciary took a more proactive role vis-a-vis -vis the parliament. At the same time, over the decades, secularism has been virulently assailed. Although the pandemic has marked the endeavors of CA and RC protesters, their songs of resistance are still fresh in our memory. Many states are passing the anti-conversion laws that outlaws religious conversion solely for the purpose of marriage, thus recognizing an unclear concept of love jihad. There is also contention over the Hindu Religious and Charitable Endowments Act, which allows state governments to take over temples and control their vast properties and assets and use the money generated. Such a thing is not applicable for mosques, churches, or gurudwaras. The idea of uniform civil code, referring to single laws for all in personal matters, is on the cards as indicated by the party in rule thus fueling the debate on secularism, which gained limelight in the Shah Bano case. In the light of the events, we conclude leaving behind questions like what lies in the future? Is Indian secularism out of date? What should be the 2021 definition of Indian secularism? And what do the recent events mean for India? With the hope to deliberate on the answers, we thank you for listening to us. Right. Uh, thank you, Anima, and uh, thank you, Nishant. It looks like something is wrong with Sanya's mic. She is not able to speak up. Uh, so, uh, without uh, uh, further ado, I would like to uh, pass on to Miss Indra Jaising, who has pre-recorded her lecture, which we will be broadcasting for the audience now. Right. The flattering introduction of me in the flyer, some of what I consider to be the most important things about myself have not been said. First, I always describe myself as one of Midnight's children. 
obviously borrowed from Salman Rushdie's book's title. But we each make what we want to of the written word. So the question for me is what do I mean when I say that I am one of Midnight's children? One obvious reference is to my age as I was born at a time when India was about to be partitioned and awake to freedom. But there are other not so obvious meanings which I will explain. Growing up in, it was the values of the freedom movement that got ingrained in us and came to be like the air that we breathe. There were deeper meanings as well. One of them being the identity of being a refugee, a displaced person from Sindh, a Hindu whose family chose to migrate to Bombay, not know, now known as Mumbai. When India was divided again along linguistic lines, we Sindhis found ourselves without a linguistic state. Yet those were heady days and the loss of a state did not bother us. Something about being a refugee gave us a unique status and a strength, the will to fight and persevere, the will to strike out on a path of one's own with no role models to follow. Not having a lawyer and my family made it easy. I would choose my own goals. If I may, here I would like to make a similar observation about the late Ramji Pilani, who too was a Sindhi refugee and a lawyer. And as I have observed before, his refugee status was something he turned to his advantage. We were often on opposite sides of an argument, but the one thing we shared in common, placement from our common village and a will to make this our own home. Love of country came not from our religious affiliations, but from the secular space, a political landscape, which allowed us to be the people we were. This is what brings me to the subject of today's discussion. I recently read an article by Salman Rushdie reflecting on his book, 25 years later. In one of the closing statements, he said that the India of today is not the India he wrote about. He did not elaborate, and I wish he had, but I know what he meant. The India of today is also not the India that I grew up in. It is on the cusp of becoming a non-secular state. When I became a lawyer, given my foundational values, I thought all I had to do was to work on social and political rights of the people and poverty would disappear. We would live in the land of prosperity. Today, I know better. I'm spending what is surely the end of a long career in law, defending my own civil and political rights and the rights of human rights defenders. All this I attribute to the creeping loss of secularism in this country. I've said it before and I will say it again. We have mastered the art of defeating the law by law and live in a state of lawlessness. It's easy. All you have to do is to define quote unquote state government to mean quote unquote central government and quote unquote central government to, meet, to mean quote unquote the president during president's rule. All you have to do is to define quote unquote the government in the GNCT Act to mean, quote unquote, the Lieutenant Governor, and the problem is resolved. When it comes to secularism, there is no need to amend anything. All you need to do is to selectively prosecute those who stand by secularism under the law of sedition. All you need to do is conflate the nation with the government at the center, and any dissent or disagreement with the politics of the center will make you a seditious person. So let's discuss the constitutional vision of secularism a little further to understand what we mean when we say the idea of India is under threat. Secularism basically denotes a separation of church and state where the church stands for religion or religious institutions. This is not to say that secularists are gnostics or irreligious. They do often profess and practice religion, 
but this practice of religion is not to be mixed up with the affairs of the state. A secular state must respect the right to religion more rigorously than any other state, for the very idea of secularism is to allow people to follow their own conscience in matters of religious equality. Our own guarantee of freedom of religion reflects this very adequately in Article 25 of the Constitution. homeland, where Hindu refugees alone are welcome. It is here that we have to remind ourselves that the height of communal violence that marked the partition, our constitution makers did not choose to have citizenship based on religion. Then why not? Why are we offering a fast track to citizenship only to Hindus and not to Muslims, India's largest minorities? We, choose the, we chose the Gandhian way of interfaith unity and peaceful coexistence in our day-to-day -day practice of secularism with a strong guarantee of freedom of religion. We must understand that secularism and the right to fully, freely practice and propagate religion go hand in hand with each other. And it is the end of the equation that it is that is in danger here in India, leading us down the slippery path of becoming a de facto theocracy. We don't have a law of blasphemy, but the law of sedition is almost taking its place in our country. Selective prosecution in the name of disrupting communal harmony disproportionately criminalizes minorities and leaves politicians of the Hindu variety free to spread hatred. Secularism and the religious beliefs and religious beliefs, we have followed a Gandhian ideal. India has adopted Gandhian values and envisaged a secular constitution that respects all religions. Gandhiji in his speech on November the 15th, 1947 said, and I quote, I maintain that India belongs to both Hindus and Muslims. You can blame anybody for what happened and say that the two nation theory is at the root of this evil and that it was the Muslim League that sowed the seeds of poison. Nevertheless, I say, we would be betraying the Hindu religion if we did evil because others have done it. India is supposed to be separating state from religion. State legislation is meant to be secular. Laws are non-religious and no religion is preferred over the other. The separation of state and religion is Pressed by the principle that the state does not interfere with religious organizations except to the extent of regula regulating maladministration and these organizations do not interfere in matters of state. Yet in the few last few years we have seen a de definite privileging of the Hindu religion Court, their separate religious laws will continue to govern them in matters of marriage, divorce, succession to property, ad adoption, and child custody. Where does this leave us in relation to interreligious marriages? The Special Marriages Act of 1955 enables such marriages without loss of religion of either party. 
But this is not the only route to marriage of two people who belong to different faiths. One of the two can, for the purpose of the marriage, convert to the faith of the other and marry under a religious law. This is an individual choice which a person must make and must be allowed to make if we truly wish to respect the right to religion. Understandably so, for Article 25, the Constitution guarantees to the citizen the freedom of conscience and the freedom to profess, practice and propagate the right to religion. In this context, a reading of Article 25 in the marginal note states, freedom of conscience and the free profession and practice of propagation of religion would lead to the conclusion that the freedom of conscience and religion would be considered interchangeable. Is as in as much as both conscience and religion are something that an individual defines for himself or herself, keep in keeping with the secular outlook of the framers of the constitution. And yet, in the last few years, we have seen specific laws targeting such marriages. I remember Safiya Jahan, a Hindu who converted to Islam and married a Muslim, went through a harrowing litigation until the Supreme Court finally declared that she was free to convert to another religion and marry the man of her choice. The arguments in court were amazingly bigoted. It was argued on behalf of her parents that, when she, that she was weak of mind, that she was brainwashed, that she was suffering from a psychological error. To, ma to marry the man she chose, she was mentally ill. The judge in open court, in a back courtroom, asked her what she wanted. And she said, in an unforgettable moment, quote, I want my husband and my religion. I would argue that the Indian legislature lacks the competence to legislate anti-conversion laws. Nothing in the three lists of the legislative uh, provisions the seventh schedule gives them such powers, neither the center nor the state. The only power to restrict the practice of religion comes from Article 25 itself, namely in the interest of public order, morality and health. A recent example of restrictions based on health would be the restrictions placed on religious places of worship in the interest of the COVID-19 pandemic the shutting down of such institutions for brief periods of time to disable the spread of the pandemic. Recognizing that in India, several social practices would need reform, which was practices linked to religion, the constitution empowers the state to enact legislation for social reform in Article 25.2a, where Practices which are basically economic, financial, and political, though associated with religion, can be reformed. Laws relating to sati would trace their origin for the, to the need for morality. Public order in Article 25 must be read with morality and must therefore take its color from that expression. Even so, we have cases where Tandav marches have been disallowed in the public domain, in the interest of maintaining public order. No other restrictions are permissible on the right to practice, profess, and propagate religion. The question, however, is can you prevent a person from adopting another religion? The obvious answer would be no, for that would defeat the very right of religion itself. I argue that the right to propagate includes the right to quote unquote convert. Indeed, the word convert is misplaced in the context of choice of religion for a person, purpose of marriage. And individuals actively quote and adopts another religion while making a choice to marry a person from a different religion under that religious personal laws. This too is a freedom that is guaranteed to us all. This is the logic of preserving personal laws. And so long as they exist, there can be no bar to adopting another religion for the purpose of marriage. I believe that the St. Stanislaus case of the Supreme Court of India has been wrongly decided, where it was held that the right to propagate does not include the right to quote unquote convert. While the word to convert may refer to the person performing the ceremony, the more appropriate question to ask would be, 
does a person have the right to adopt another religion? The answer would only be a clear and categorical yes. The only circumstances when an adoption of a religion would be unconstitutional is when a person adopts a religion for the role, sole purpose of getting rid of an inconvenient wife or marrying multiple wives. It has been so held in the Sarla Mutpul case by the Supreme Court of India. The irony is that it is Hindu men who often convert to Islam to marry another woman or for marrying more than one wife. Perhaps we need a law to address this kind of misuse. Placing the anti-conversion laws in this context, it is important to highlight the specific aspects of acts which are in violation of the secular foundations of this country. Ironically named freedom of religion acts, the prima facie goal of such acts seems to be prevention of forceful conversions. However, particular clauses in these acts seem to betray the values of secularism and fail to recognize the individual's right to relinquish their religion and adopt another faith. Inducement and allurement have no legal meaning. They have found their way into acts such as the Orissa Freedom of Religion Act 1967. In the Madhya Pradesh Ordinance of 2021, and both words don't have any legal definition. And some states, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, and Uttar Pradesh attempt to define them as follows. Quote, offer of any temptation in the form of any gift or gratification or material benefit, either in cash or kind or employment, free education in reputed schools run by any religious body, easy money, better lifestyle, divine displeasure, or otherwise. This definition targets in an unlawful manner the Christian community, which runs reputed schools and provides free education to their beneficiaries. There can be nothing wrong in a conversion that results in a person's adopting a religion from getting the benefit of their other co-religionists away of. While the definition of inducement, allurement, and fraud are similar across the board in all acts, the definition of force in the Orissa Act, among other states, is extended to include the threat of divine displeasure or social excommunication. Given the ostensible purpose of these acts is the protection of the individual's right to freedom of religion, it's strange that it criminalizes such persons who consider it an essential part of their religion to talk about divine displeasure in the afterlife. The targeting of divine displeasure as an as unlawful is a direct criminalization of the beliefs of religious communities and amounts to a denial of the right to practice that religion. These laws are liable to be challenged on the ground that they violate Article 25. Additionally, the acts of Arunachal Pradesh and Dharka purport to define tribal communities and to protect them. Some of them define indigenous faiths and their festivals. These laws are targeted at preventing tribals from adopting religion and hence contain a definition of what are indigenous faiths. It is worth relating, however, that the Hindu Marriage and Succession Act, all laws define Hindu as, as including scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Some of them actually purport to define religion. The Himachal Pradesh Act defines it as follows, quote, Religion means an organized system of faith, belief, worship, or lifestyle as prevailing in India or any part of it and defined under any law or custom for the time being in force, close court. Apart from flying in the face of the constitution's secular ideals, this definition fails to account for faiths that may not have an organized form. It also introduced the concept of quote unquote lifestyle as religion for the first time. This is a definite giveaway that alludes to the debates on Hindutva being a way of life and perhaps a telling sign of the times to come. Perhaps the most significant fa factor in these freedom of religion laws of recent origin is the clause that lays down that conversion by marriage or for the purpose of marriage as grounds for unlawful conversion. Believing in the institution of marriage is a deeply personal choice. 
as is the decision to convert to a religion of one's partner. Those who wish to marry under personal laws must undergo religious conversion prior to marriage ceremony or its registration. However, for outlawing conversion from one religion to another religion by marriage, the state is seeking to prevent all conversion by marriage. This implies that anybody who converts for the purpose of marrying a person of another religion would be committing a crime. crime. The Himachal Pradesh Freedom of Religion Act mentions marriage for the sole purpose of conversion, directly questioning the bona fides of the marriage. I would like to say that the affidavit filed by the Allah in the Halabad High Court by the state of Uttar Pradesh has stated that conversion to satisfy the requirements of personal laws is forced conversion, implying that no interfaith marriage can take place under personal laws in that state. By adding these clauses that specifically deal with interfaith marriage, the law effectively restricts the couple's choice whether to marry under the Special Marriages Act or under personal laws. Is this not an infringement of one right to choose their religion as well as the right to marry a person of their choice in a manner of their choosing, especially in a country that has plural legal systems? While the women's movement in India has always held the threat of a uniform civil court would victimize minority communities and force them to abandon their personal laws. It did not anticipate that this agenda could be achieved in another way by disabling the right of a woman from adopting another personal law, thus compelling all religious communities to remain within their own fold. Far from imposing a common civil code, the state is now creating watertight personal laws where there is no possibility of moving from one religious system to another, not even for the purpose of marrying a loved one. Hindutva has find multiple, found multiple ways of propagating itself, one of them being to confine communities within their religious fold and not permitting them to intermarry. I would like to conclude once again with my personal journey, beginning as I did, my journey as one of midnight's children who believed that my agenda was to work on social and political, social and economic rights, I have reached the conclusion that I cannot defend my own social and political rights, my own social and economic rights or anyone else's without defending civil and political rights. I have come to the conclusion that human rights defenders are the new minorities of India. And it's essential for an autocratic state to target human rights defenders to achieve the agenda of a complete demolition of the secular credentials of the constitution of India. The secular constitution is endangered by such political agendas and their vigilante groups. It is up to us to defend this precious constitution and its underpinnings of secularism. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now, on to the much awaited part of the discussion. I call upon Priyanka and Siddharth, who are the moderators for the session. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Sanya. Uh, that was truly an insightful speech. Uh, I'm Siddharth Kaushik, and I'll be acting as one of the moderators for the next part of our discussion. Uh, Priyanka? Uh, thank you, Siddharth. I am Priyanka and I am a student of first year, uh, first year English honors from Hindu College University of Delhi. Talking about the structure of today's session after the speech being done, we will now move on to the moderated uh, discussion followed by uh, Q&A session 
which will be co uh, comprising of a preset question which we have received during the process of registration. And then we will be taking up live questions from our audience present with us on both Zoom and YouTube. We will then conclude today's session. Now, uh, uh, can we have the pre presentation? Uh, we'll move to the uh, moderator's questions now. We've had yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. And, sure. yeah. Uh, Ms. Jaising, uh, I'll be asking the first question and uh, throughout your speech, there was a lot of undertoning of how the current situation is, right? And from that, I pick up my question that, do you think that today in the current regime, the way things are done, the way policies are made and the way laws are made, right? Which some might say favor the majority. Do you think that we are running the risk of hurting the jurisprudence of our country so much so that even if there's a change in the government, the fear of antagonizing the majority might prevent uh, different and new governments from making secular laws. And then again, falling back to uh, making laws and policies, which in turn only favor the majority and are not really secular in nature. Thank you for that question. I find the question a little hypothetical and a bit uh, complex. So let me try and answer it as best as I can. Uh, in my opinion, the ultimate arbiter between a law and its constitutional validity is the judiciary. And if we have the confidence that we can turn to the judiciary, we then don't have much to fear. But the problem is that when democracy fails, the judiciary also tends to fail. And therefore, I think our primary task is to uh, strengthen democracy at the grassroots level, uh, to fight every inch of the way, to defend every single effort to erode uh, the values of our constitution. So regardless of which government comes and which government goes, the role, our role as a citizen is, is going to be the same. Uh, and so I don't think we should bother too much about which government comes and which government goes. We should focus on our own role, which is our very, very precious right to our own voice, to our right to dissent. And of course, uh, do everything within our power to ensure that the judiciary doesn't let us down. Uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, now we'll have Priyanka for the next moderated question. Uh, before that, I'll, I'd will just like to inform everyone that the audience can start putting up the questions in the Q&A box now. Yeah, Priyanka. I think there's Can some. I Can I yeah, yeah, you can go ahead. Thank you, uh, ma'am. Uh, my question to you is: Indian judiciary can pronounce on the matters which concern theology. To what extent is this, is it appropriate for secular courts to interpret the religious scriptures? Are you asking me about courts, uh, about the, the hierarchy of courts and their respective roles? If you could just repeat your question again. Uh, Indian judiciary can pronounce on the matters which concern theology. So uh, to what extent is it appropriate for secular courts to interpret the religious scriptures? Yours is a question which requires a very lengthy answer. But I pointed you to the provisions of Article 25, which say that practices which are economic, financial, or secular associated with religion can be reformed. And that is what brings in the role of the judiciary. So the judiciary can intervene in that domain, can also intervene in the domain of maladministration and corruption within religious organizations and endowments. 
I give you a small example, not a small, a very big example of what happened in the Supreme Court of India today. There was a petition filed by a gentleman who came to court with a petition saying certain verses in the Quran should be deleted from the Quran. Of course, mercifully, the bench of the Supreme Court not only rejected the petition, but also imposed cost on the petitioner. Now, that's a classic case of what the court cannot do. It's malicious to approach a court of law asking the court to rewrite a religious text. You have the freedom to follow it or not to follow it. That's your choice. But to expect a constitutional court to rewrite a religious text, especially in relation to a religion which is more than 1,600 years old, is really being wicked. And uh, that kind of tells you that there is a dividing line between what the court can do and what the court can't do. Oh, thank you so much, ma'am. Now moving on to Siddharth. Yeah, uh, thank you, Priyanka. Ma'am, for my next question, uh, I'll be focusing a little on uh, the criticism that the Supreme Court has faced in recent years for the last decade or so, right? So, uh, and even before that, for that matter, uh, cases like the Sabrimala judgment and the triple talaq case, a lot of criticism was coming in for the Supreme Court that it is taking a little too much liberty in deciding what essential religious practices are and even demarcating between the customs and the religious practices. Uh, do you think that at times we tend to be a little too harsh on the Supreme Court, considering that uh, the alternatives that we are, have at hand is what some would call a tyrant of a government or maybe a little too orthodox religious institutions? Do you think that we are a little too uh, harsh on the judiciary and the Supreme Court? Siddharth, it's interesting that both the examples that you mentioned concern the rights of women. So one question that needs to be asked is why is it that this criticism of the Supreme Court comes when the court has expanded the rights of women, be it in the Triple Talaq case or be it in the Shabri Malak case? Yeah. So uh, when you're watching criticism, you need to discern between criticism which is bona fide and that which is mala fide. For me, the real tragedy lies elsewhere. The real tragedy lies during elections when even those who supported the Shabri Malai judgment are actively campaigning and saying that if and when they come to power, they will undo the Shabri Malai judgment. So I, I don't pay too much attention to criticism of the Supreme Court. I prefer to make up my own mind about the role of the Supreme Court in democratic societies. I do hope that has answered your question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, for this uh, moderated uh, questions, the last question that I'll be coming up with is, it's uh, sort of tracing the history of Supreme Court once again. Like, uh, you know, if you trace the history of Supreme Court, some would say that over time, uh, post the 1980s and 90s, uh, the Supreme Court is becoming narrower in its understanding of what the term secular is. You know, if we go back to the 60s and the 50s, the Supreme Court rather re uh, refrained itself from making, uh, let's say, hostile judgments for that matter or polarized judgments for that matter. Do you think that in the last 20, 30 years, the understanding of secularism by the Supreme Court has gotten narrower? And if you do agree with that hypothesis, what reason do you think is for uh, is for this narrow of our uh, narrower understanding of secularism? Is it fair to you know put it to one single party, the rise of one single party, or is it uh, let's say issues like judicial activism, or for that matter, uh, a change in the socio cultural situation in our country? Okay, uh, it's probably a com combination of all the three factors, but I think the turning point came when the Supreme Court said that Hindutva is a way of life. Instead of recognizing it as a political ideology targeting secularism, they legitimized it. And the shocking thing is till today, there are petitions challenging that judgment, but till today the Supreme Court has 
not listed those petitions for hearing. The most uh, foul manifestations of the lack of, of the erosion of secularism are seen during elections. And even that law relating to uh, the extent to which religion can be used as an electoral tool to canvas for votes is just not very clear at all, despite the fact that we've got one recent judgment of the Supreme Court, which attempts to define whether a candidate can seek votes on the basis of religion, but it fell short of articulating the dividing line between an appeal based on human rights and an appeal based on discrimination. So the problems are very deep rooted. Uh, I don't know how to answer your question, except to say that most of these judges are drawn from society. But hey, man, let's look at the composition of the Supreme Court. Let's look at its caste profile. Let's look at its gender profile. Let's look at its religious profile. Where are the minorities? Where are the SC? Where are the ST? How can we expect uh, an outcome? Because, you know, these things matter. They're not decisive. Your background doesn't tell you uh, how you're going to decide, but it's the personal is political. We all know that. And, you know, uh, like I started this whole lecture by telling you that my profession has been defined by the fact that I started out life as a refugee. Now, it doesn't mean that every case I argue is for refugees, but it helps me to understand something like secularism, something like democracy, something like what it means to be a citizen, what it means to be displaced. And so I think the problem is very, very deep rooted. And I think we need to do a cost analysis of the uh, profile of Supreme Court judges. First and foremost, Supreme Court judges and High Court judges do not need to display their religion in public by putting out visuals of themselves going into temples and praying. I don't, I don't think they should, they, they don't have a right to go to a temple and pray, but why make it also public? So we, you know, the, the change that we have to see is very, very deep rooted. I don't know when it will come, not in my lifetime, maybe yours. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, just a small follow up on that. Uh, you said that the judges of Supreme Court and the High Court should not be going to uh, publicizing their religious beliefs. Would you say the same for politicians? Oh, yes, I would. I certainly would, maybe more so. <laughs> because uh, and, 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 you know, what, what the leader of a nation does and doesn't do it has an impact absolutely down the line. And the more popular the reader, leader, the more the impact. So yes, the answer is a categorical yes. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, with this, we come to an end to the moderated questions part. Now we'll move towards the preset questions, the questions we got during the registrations for the event. Uh, Priyanka. Thank you, Siddharth. Now moving on to the preset questions, uh, Vasudev Reddy has asked, uh, what are the effects of re-exploration of sites on secularism? That is, petitions like mosques are constructed on already existed temples. Uh, we all know that we do have a Places of Worship Act, which freezes the status quo as of 1947, but the distressing news is that petitions have been filed challenging that act and notice has been issued and the answer to the question is awaited. But in my opinion, you need a constitutional cutoff point. And for me, the constitutional cutoff point is 1947. And of course, from then onwards, to suggest that we should go back a century, two or three centuries is utter madness. So we need to we need to be there when the Supreme Court is deciding this question of the validity of the Places of Worship Act. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Now I'd like Siddharth to take over for uh, the live questions part. Right. Thank you, Priyanka. Uh, so the first live question that we've received is from Avanindra. 
uh, he says that with the rise in the number of people who openly identify themselves as representative of a particular sect coming in power and holding constitutional posts where do you think ma'am indian secularism is set to reach that is a loaded question isn't it um uh, yes the reference is again to hindu religionists uh and to people who hold positions so i would divide the question into those who don't hold positions and those who hold positions of a constitutional nature uh and i would argue that a person who holds a position of a priest or a uh, the head of a religious institution cannot simultaneously occupy the position a constitutional position uh which comes through an election mm. and uh, however this proposition is yet to be tested in a court of law uh i haven't seen it being argued but i guess the time is right to argue that question right thank you ma'am uh, uh... the next live question priyanka please take it up uh yes akash thiman has asked is judiciary increasingly becoming partisan by encouraging majoritarianism with a vis the ayodhya verdict and the recent order on janvapri mosque will such orders open the pandora box of disputes on religious places across the country mam mam can you hear us i think something is wrong with mam's no no yeah uh, can you hear us mam Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, Priyanka, please do so. Uh, this question is by Akash Thiman. Is judiciary increasingly becoming partisan by encouraging majoritarianism? That is through uh, the Ayodhya verdict and the recent order on Janvapri Mosque. Will such orders open the Pandora box of disputes on religious places across the country? you know i could give a very glib answer to that question i could give an answer which is in a yes or no format but i think that discussion takes us nowhere i mean the real question is why are we seeing what i would describe as a failing judiciary okay uh, a a judicial judgment is judged by the uh, quality of its reasoning not necessarily by what it decides uh judges do have the freedom to decide in which of a way the question is is it a well reasoned judgment and i think what we are seeing now is is judgments that are not based on reason not based on legal analysis and uh, that's what i think we need to be worrying about at the moment otherwise i can have an answer which says yes and i can have an answer which says no and both answers would be true Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. Over to you, Siddharth. Yes. Ah, uh, for the third question, we have it from Shreya. Ah, uh, she asks, ma'am, today, ah, uh, the Supreme Court dismissed Vasim Rizvi's plea seeking removal of certain verses from the Quran as they promote violence. What are your views on Rizvi's claim on the possibility of these verses being used to indoctrinate children in madrasas? Ah, uh, madrasas. and perhaps being the cause of radical islamic terrorism in one word islamophobic uh it was a malicious and a vicious and a untenable petition and i don't need to say that i already said it uh that i was very pleased to see that a bench 
headed by Justice Nariman, threw it out of hand and imposed costs. You know, the issue really was, does the Supreme Court have the jurisdiction to decide these issues? And that question was asked earlier, where does one draw the dividing line? There is a dividing line, okay? And let's not fall prey to this trap of taking every issue to the Supreme Court of India or to the high courts, okay? It's time that we, as citizens, as litigants, realize that some issues uh, cannot be judicialized and others can be. Right, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Priyanka? Uh, thank you, Siddharth. Now, moving on to the fourth question. Prasant have asked, recently, Chief Justice Bobde lauded the Uniform Civil Code in Goa. Since uh, Uniform Civil Code is in the Constitution, can we oppose it in principle if the purpose is to bring gender equality within every religion? Okay. Uh, nobody I know has opposed uh, a common civil code. Uh, it might interest you to know that the Law Commission issued a report very recently, uh, about a year ago, in which the Law Commission said that we don't need a common civil code. And the Law Commission recommended that individual laws be reformed. So sure, of course, the Chief Justice of India is, is well entitled to his own opinion, and it's a legitimate opinion. But I, what we are seeing in India is the reverse through these marriage laws, which actually say that you can't jump from one religion to another religion for the purpose of marriage. I can't help but comment that uh, Dr. Ambedkar, the architect of our constitution, actually suggested interreligious marriages as one way of ending the institution of caste. So, uh, well, we're all entitled to our own opinions. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, now, over to Siddharth. Yeah, uh, for the next question, uh, we have it from Dimash Mittal. Uh, ma'am, what do you think about the exemptions given earlier to minority institutions under RTE, the right to education, or about the right of minorities to set up and administer their own educational institutions, and by corollary, not the majority? Uh, let me take the second uh, 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 issue first. Uh, we all know that in the TMA Pai case, uh, the Supreme Court of India decided that uh, there is a right to set up educational institutions um, for minorities, almost equating educational institutions to business and industry. I uh, believe that there, is, uh, that there is a right to, in minorities, it is there in black and white in Article 30 of the Constitution of India, to set up educational institutions of their choice. This is for the reason that it helps them to perpetuate their culture, their religion, and their language. So it's a, it is a protection that minorities need. Uh, I do not think, uh, well, you know, it, it's a very strange equation because everything that's not minority is majority and no one has ever stopped the majority from doing what they want to do. Right. So, and I certainly don't think that they're entitled to exemption from the Right to Education Act. That was not the ruling of the Supreme Court in the full bench. It's a subsequent development. Right. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, for the last question, Priyanka, could you go ahead? The last live question. Yes, yes. Thank you, Siddharth. For uh, the sixth question and the last one of live question and answer part is from Ghansham Roy. Where is uh, the space to reform the communal religious practices when even a slightest of criticism can turn into a case of hurt of religious sentiments? Can we freely practice secularism without hurting religious sentiments? Um, I don't quite understand the question, but let me try and answer it. Um, you see, the reform of practices associated with religion goes back to the pre-constitutional period. Uh, many of you will remember that the abolition of sati happened during the colonial rule. And uh, as I was reading some of the literature surrounding that, I realized that it was done in the name of morality. And uh, as I looked even deeper, I found that the concept of morality was what you call constitutional morality, 
existed even in international instruments. So it's very uh, real and it's very deep rooted. So yes, there will always be borderline cases, but there will all there will also be cases which fall on this side of the line and that side of the line. And if somebody were to argue that let's bring back sati because it's a practice associated with religion, I would uh, protest that claim. And so there are certain uh, black and white uh, uh, boundaries when it comes to uh, practices which are claimed to be associated. For me, the issue of women entering Shabri Malai or the refusal to enter the Shabri Malai on the ground that they were menstruated and they were polluted was a black and white issue. And I thought that women should be allowed to enter and that men to not allow them to enter was to discriminate against them based on sex, based on their menstrual uh, biology, uh, physiology, and uh, it was certainly unconstitutional. So there are going to be these kind of challenges which are continue, which are going to continue to face us, and they get decided on a case to case basis. And as we can see, sorry, as we can see, sometimes they do offend a lot of people, but a constitutional court has to stick to its own constitutional morality and the black and white provisions of the constitution. Right. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, for the question and answer session. Uh, we come to an end to this particular session, uh, this particular part of the session today. And I'm sure that each and every one of us is much more uh, you know, eager to learn more about the legalities of the issues that are surrounding us today. And I'm pretty sure that each and every one of us is going back with more than we came to the session with. Yeah, uh, back to you, Sanya. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jessing. Uh, that was indeed an extremely informative and entertaining session. I'm absolutely certain that all of us have greatly learned from your insight of the constitution, legal structure and framework today. This brings us to the end of the second session for Compass 2021. I would like to ask Vice President of Caucus, Shanmuk Aditya, to deliver the word of thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sanya. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, I take a great pleasure in delivering the vote of thanks for today's wonderful session. Uh, first of all, I wish to thank uh, Ms. Indira Jaising for taking out her time, patiently coordinating with our team all throughout and enlightening us with her wisdom. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the principal of Hindu College, the vice principal of Hindu College, the director of internal quality assurance cell of Hindu College, and our teacher in charge of the society for having invested considerable amount of energy in the success of this session. Uh, further, I wish to express my gratitude for Live Law, our media partner, for collaborating with Caucus for this session. Uh, thanks are also due for the members of the audience for turning up in such good numbers and patiently engaging with us throughout. Thank you all. Over to you, Sanya. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us today. For the knowledge of our audience, a transcript of this conversation will be available on our website, and you can find us at www.caucushindu.in. So that is all from our side today. Join us again on 17th of April, where we are in conversation with the Chief Scientist of WHO, Ms. Swami Swaminathan. That's it from our side. Bye-bye. Uh, we'll see you again soon.